Great to see you. Hope you had an excellent week and got to be grateful for lots of good things. And as David mentioned and Gabby read, we are turning into the Advent season. And that means, among other things around here, that there are a bunch of exciting Christmas events on our church calendar. We have next Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m., our kids' Christmas program. So I know many of you have kids at home who have been practicing the songs for weeks. It'll be a wonderful time. We've got a cookie reception after that to follow. Uh, we're going to have a worship time on the 17th, sing some Christmas songs. But then also, these Christmas Eve gatherings on the 24th, this year, Christmas Eve is a Sunday which always makes for an interesting programming decision on our part. Do you do Sunday morning? Do you do Sunday night? We decided, how about all day Sunday? Let's just do gatherings all day Sunday. And so 9, 11, 1, 3, and then 11 p.m. for you night owls who love that midnight Christmas Eve tradition. We have free tickets available at gracesnellville.com slash events. And so we ask that you do just go on there and lock in your time with your family so that you know you'll have a seat. Usually our Christmas Eve gatherings fill up, uh, seats fill up. And I know for a lot of you, planning your Sunday, planning your Christmas Eve is a key part of the whole celebration of Christmas. And so we encourage you to go check that out. One other thing to mention is that we have 67 Advent boxes left. Uh, we made 300 of those. And so if you haven't gotten one and you'd like to, it's a kit that looks just like this. There's a wreath, there's candles inside, there are readings. And so if you'd like to celebrate Advent at home and you don't have the supplies to do so, uh, we've got all that put together in a simple kit. You can get those out in the foyer for $20. And we're actually using any proceeds that come from this Advent box project to help support Christians in Gaza. And so if you've been with us these last few weeks, we've been tracking and praying for the roughly 900 Christians in Gaza amidst that brutal war between Israel and Hamas and really trying to seek out ways that we can support them. And we've mentioned several times that we've got connections to be able to help provide food to the Christians who are primarily sheltering in one of the two Christian churches over there in Gaza during the warfare. And so for $5, we can provide a meal to a Christian family. And so we are making it known that if you have a desire to support Christians in Gaza, uh, you can do that by scanning with your phone that QR code. Or you can also go to gracesnellville.com slash Gaza. And if you have $5, $20, whatever it may be, so far here at Snellville, we've raised $34,000 for Gazans, which is a wonderful thing. Yeah, thank you so much for your generosity. And uh, it's a powerful moment for us to be united with our brothers and sisters in a war-torn part of the world where we've got a lot of history and a lot of relationships. And speaking of those relationships, um, some of you know Kenny and Kristen, uh, some great dear friends of ours, me personally, but also our community. Uh, Kenny is a professor just outside of Jerusalem now. Um, but they are in contact with believers in Gaza and they sent back this update video. And so I want to invite you guys to watch that as it continues to guide the way we pray for and support uh, our brothers and sisters in the midst of that conflict. Let's go ahead and roll that video. Hey guys, uh, Kenny and Kristen here. Uh, we're sending you this message uh, from Jerusalem. Uh, we live here with our three children and we work uh, directly with Palestinians. Uh, we know that Gazan Christians need our prayers and support. Uh, we've been following their situation very closely. Uh, we've been in touch with Christian leaders directly involved with them. We have first-hand knowledge of the challenge, how challenging it is for them and how much they cover, covet our help. Um, and we couldn't think of a better way to ask you to pray for them by, than by sharing a request with you that we, re we received from a mother um, of some young children who's currently living in Gaza. Uh, so Kristen's going to read uh, this, this uh, prayer request, and while she's reading, we're going to put a picture on the screen of some Christians sheltering in one of the churches there in Gaza. It was taken a few days ago. And for the woman's privacy, we've changed her name. So thanks for your prayers and support and for letting us share this with you.
My name is Mary. I graduated master's graduate from Bible College in Bethlehem. I do not want to share much personal information to protect my safety and the safety of my family. I'm a displaced person in the church in Gaza, and every day new families join us. We are approximately 570 people, and in a neighboring church there are more than 300. We are located in the northern half of the Gaza Strip. I want to share with you that our hearts are broken and we are full of fear and sadness. We are peaceful Christians and reject violence from both sides. Love, as Christ taught us, is the most effective weapon for peace. There are many people who we love died, who have died. Our family members have died. My cousins and her children died. My best friend died. My daughter's best friend died. In the midst of sadness, pain, and heartbreak, we look at the face of Jesus Christ. I would like to share with you the humanitarian situation here. It is cat catastrophic on the psychological, physical, and spiritual levels. There is very little food, and soon we will not be able to find food or water, which will cause us to starve. As a mother of two children, I'm afraid for the future. My children's psychological state is very bad, especially with the lack of food. My heart is bleeding and wounded. I don't expect to be able to recover. There are many people whose voices aren't heard, and we don't know if there's media reporting any of this. We are not numbers. Each of us has a dream, but I'm afraid that our dreams will end and the nightmare never will. We see death everywhere. We smell death everywhere. The people of Jesus are heartbroken and waiting for healing and peace. We want to live. I cry while I write this because my people, people who have nothing to do with politics or violence, are burned, broken, and heartbroken. All I can think to do is write and hope that people will listen. Please don't forget us. Please pray for us. Yeah, let's pray now. Father in heaven, we hear that prayer request. And from the other side of the world, we come to you and we ask that you would bring peace, that you would bring healing, that you would bring your truth. Lord, sometimes when we hear a request like that, we don't even really know how to pray. And yet your word says that your Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf with groanings deeper than words. And so, Lord, we pray as our hearts go out to this woman and to her family and to the Christians in Gaza and then even beyond the Christians to the Palestinians and the Jewish people who are suffering, to hostages, uh, to politicians trying to make decisions. Lord, in all these things, we just ask that you would extend your grace and your wisdom and we tell you, Lord, we trust you. But would you cut short the days of suffering? In Jesus' name, amen. We got that video um, just before news of the ceasefire uh, that started on Friday. And so there are several days here where they are exchanging hostages between Palestinians and the Jewish people. And we're hopeful that Somehow that ceasefire will lead to a longer peace. But um, let's get into the scripture. I think we need some scripture. That's what we need right now. Uh, if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to the book of First Thessalonians in chapter 4. And we're going to talk about heavenly hope. If you don't have a Bible, you can slip up your hand. We'll put a Bible in your hand. Also, if you need a sheet for notes... You can get that with a hand in the air. As always, at the bottom is a connection card. I would encourage you to fill that out, especially if you have prayer requests or praises, and you fill that out, detach it from the bottom, and drop it in one of the offering boxes on either side of the room. And so, as we get into 1 Thessalonians 4, this Advent season, as David mentioned a moment ago, we are going to focus on the traditional Advent themes of hope, peace, joy, and love. But... Maybe this season with a little bit of a twist. 
Because the word Advent means arrival, and it is the church season when we prepare to celebrate the arrival or the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. But here is the twist. Even as we celebrate Jesus' arrival on earth, we remember that he promised he would return, that there will be a second advent or a second coming when the work he began during his first advent will be completed in his return. And so this year at Grace, we're looking forward not just to celebrating Christmas on December 25th, but also we're looking forward to the celebration of the great day of the Lord when he comes back. Which is a little bit strange because if you're like me, Christmas seems festive, but the day of the Lord can seem a bit fearful. Uh, Christmas sounds like a bit of a joyful time, and it is. The day of the Lord sounds like judgment. Sometimes the stories around Jesus' birth are so familiar that they're almost too comforting to the point that we overlook the poverty of the shepherds or the cruelty of Herod. On the other hand, our expectations of Jesus' return are often confused to the point that we lose the beauty of the promises that will be fulfilled and that we miss the blessed hope we have in Christ. And so for these next few weeks, we're going to see how the scripture can help set us straight, not so much on Christmas itself, because most of us know those stories, but on that second advent return of Jesus that we wait for with expectation. And so this week, we are looking at hope. What is our hope? And we'll start in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, and I'm going to read down through the end of the chapter. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Oh, so right off the bat, we find Paul contrasting human hope versus heavenly hope. In verse 13, human hope is, according to Paul, no hope at all. Over in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about this. He says, talking about his uh, struggles and persecutions, he said, if I fought wild beasts in Ephesus, with nothing more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. This is Paul's summary of human hope, because human hope is reduced to merely worldly things. Let us eat and drink, and tomorrow we die. Uh, so people who hope, all humans are hopers. All humans are hopers. When you lose hope as a human, you lose that drive to even live. But when you hope in your human capacity, apart from the heavenly promises, you tend to reduce your hopes to just the next worldly thing, the next ball game, uh, maybe someday getting married and having children. Uh, but you cannot, in a merely human hope, deal with death. In other words, human hopes take the best experiences of life and asks them to fulfill the deep longing of our hearts. 
One of the songs that our family, our kids especially, they love is by Panic at the Disco. And it came out about five years ago. And the title of the song is High Hopes. I want you to listen to it as a great example, just the first 30 seconds of this idea of human hope. Can we play that? Um, actually, I, we, we cut the audio before the drop because we have good subwoofers in here. We really could have made the kids downstairs know we were listening to some pop music, right? But think about these lyrics, okay? I mean, first of all, you hear it and the horns are coming in and the beat is good. And so you like feel something kind of hopeful in the song itself. But these are the lyrics. Had to have high, high hopes for a living, shooting for the stars when I couldn't make a killing financially. Didn't have a dime, but I always had a vision, always had high, high hopes. Then down to the verses, you get into, Mama said, fulfill the prophecy, be something greater, go make a legacy, manifest destiny. Back in the days, we wanted everything, we wanted everything. It feels good, but what is the basis of hope in these lyrics? Go make a legacy, manifest destiny, do your best, conquer. But when you look at it carefully, the foundation of hope in these verses is you. You are your best hope. You are the one in a million. You're the one who, if you just try hard enough, you can make a living. And what is that object of your hope? What, what are you hoping for in the song? Oh, that, that you could make a killing, that you could make a living, that you could basically get fame and fortune and comfort, you know. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And how do you hope? Well, mama said, don't give up. Always had a feeling I'd be one in a million. Like, the way you hope is just try harder. This is a pretty helpful portrait of human hope. But when you dig into human hope, apart from something beyond, you find it's hollow. And I admit, a pop song is certainly not scripture. But then again, my kids can sing most of those lyrics from memory, maybe more effectively they, than they can recite scripture. I mean, I'm grateful for kids' life because they're memorizing the scripture and the things we're doing at home. But if we're not careful, the slogans and the choruses of the culture can begin to shape our thoughts more than the scriptures themselves. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves living more in human hope than heavenly hope. And so Paul, here in these verses, says he wants us to understand heavenly hope. And there are three things we find in the passage. The basis for heavenly hope, that is why we can have hope. Then we have the object of our heavenly hope, that is what we're hoping for. And then finally, the act of hoping. How do we live full of hope? Heavenly hope. What is the basis for our hope? In verse 14, he says, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Look at Paul's logic. There was an event, Jesus' death and resurrection, that makes another event possible. Our resurrection in Christ. Uh, think about that logic. There was an event that makes another event possible. Um, this weekend, we went to, well, no, before the weekend, this week, we went to Costco to get ready for Thanksgiving, and we just happened to walk through one of the aisles, and these shoes, which are Adidas shoes, were $9.99. I couldn't believe it, because they're very comfortable, and I can't, the price still astounds me, saying it out loud. 
And so I went to Costco and I bought these shoes for less than $10. That's an event. But once I tell you about that event, it makes in another event possible. And the other event that's possible is that you too could go to Costco <laughs> and buy these shoes. I mean, they're great. I should have bought some for the whole staff. We could have all been shod and similarly. But this is one of those situations where there's one event and makes another event possible. You hear from me, those shoes are at Costco, and you're like, oh, cool, maybe I need some of those same kind of shoes. Maybe you don't like them, that's fine. But one, you know, that's up to the Holy Spirit. And so <laughs> one event makes another event possible. And now I use the word event on purpose because the basis for our hope as followers of Jesus is not, as some would claim, simply blind faith, just believing in some pie in the sky idea. Rather, the basis of our hope is the historical event of the resurrection. Now, each of the gospel writers, if you read Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, they go to great lengths to tell the story, not only of Jesus' life, but also his death and resurrection. And they make it so clear, they're not telling a parable. They're not passing along some inspiring story. They're saying, we actually saw Jesus after he died and he was alive. We felt the scars in his hands and in his side. And this is quite different than many of the other parallel accounts of resurrection you find in other great world religions, you know, like Odin and Norse mythology, or there's some of the Buddhist traditions that have some accounts of resurrection. But in all those circumstances, it's always told as this sort of mythological story. And there are not claims, like we find in the Gospels, of real people saying, we saw Jesus with our own eyes alive. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, says, Jesus appeared to Peter, and then he appeared to the 12, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time after his resurrection, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. Paul's talking about, of course, Jesus appearing to him on the Damascus road. And so our basis for hope is this written eyewitness account of multiple people who said they saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. This may be a crazy comparison, but it is an accepted historical fact that the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar was assassinated by his surrounding senators on the Ides of March, March 15th in 44 BC. Read any history book of antiquity and they will say, yeah, Julius Caesar was assassinated by the people around him. It shows up in the Shakespeare play, the famous line, et tu brute, all of that stuff. But did you know there is not one eyewitness account of that story? That the closest document that we have is the writings of Suetonius, which are more than 150 years later. The point there is that there is far more evidence testifying to the resurrection of Jesus than to the assassination of Caesar. And yet, for some reason, historians find it far easier to believe the date and time of Caesar's assassination than the testimony of Jesus' resurrection. And of course, it's not solely our choice about whether we will believe or not believe this testimony of the saints who saw Jesus after the resurrection. Uh, scripture says there is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit by which God makes it possible for us to believe in the resurrection. That means that everybody who embraces Jesus says, yes, I follow you. You died for my sins and rose again. Like everybody who, who comes to that point and is born again, that's a miracle of the Holy Spirit. And yet it's still important for us to remember that the basis of our hope is not some melody that makes us feel good. It is the eyewitness account of the event of the resurrection. That's the basis, a foundation of our hope, something that happened in history. But then, what is the what? What are we hoping for? And look at how Paul writes 
we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. One event that makes another event possible. And the other event is that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, these two words, and so, are very important. The Greek there is a word that means in the same way. So, here's what Paul says. What God did for Jesus in his death and resurrection, that is, giving Jesus a new resurrection body, in the same way, God will do that for all of the faithful, that we too will all receive resurrection bodies. Maybe a way to think about this is the idea of a prototype. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Jesus is the first fruits. In our technological world, sometimes we talk about prototypes, the first of its kind, the model that will be the basis for all the ones that follow. Uh, This picture here is the prototype of the super soaker. You guys ever use a super soaker water pistol? I mean, I remember these came out kind of at the peak of my childhood, and it was a massive advance in water munitions, okay? Because what you used to have was basically the equivalent of like a little gleek, you know, like just these just little bits of water coming out of those little pump. And then all of a sudden you have a super soaker. It was like walking around with a hose in your hands. And so the guy who invented this, actually, you can show the next slide, named Lonnie Johnson. And Lonnie Johnson was trying to figure out a way to make a refrigerator that didn't use Freon. He wanted to use water instead. And that invention never happened, but this ended up being his most lucrative invention, the super soaker. You can see his patent right there. But the idea here is that that first model with a two liter bottle of uh, Coke empty to do the tank and made out of PVC pipe and everything else was the prototype for all the super soakers that would follow in the same way. And so exactly the same idea. But unlike the products that get better in the design cycle, like a super soaker, what we find in Jesus is that he is the perfect prototype. That he is the one who establishes the blueprint for what we look forward to. Going on here in our verse, I, I have those pictures too, great. All right, it says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, we'll talk about the idea of meeting the Lord in the air in just a second, but, but first, if Jesus is the prototype, there are some implications we need to consider when it comes to the object of our hope, that is what we are hoping for. Number one, death is not the end of the story for the faithful. That's an obvious implication. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, Paul says. Death is not the end. Jesus' death on the cross was not the end of Jesus' life. He was resurrected. And so in the same way, when the faithful sleep, as Paul says, it is not the end. Now, the next thing that we need to consider, the implication of this, if Jesus is the prototype, then our hope is not just a spiritual hope, but also a physical hope. Because Jesus was not merely resurrected as some kind of ghost, Jesus was resurrected in the body. He ate food. He walked around. They could touch and feel him. He was substantive. And if Jesus is the prototype, that means that we too, who trust in Jesus, will receive the same kind of resurrection body that Jesus presently has. So our hope is not just spiritual, but it's also physical. Now, that means if our hope is physical then heaven is not our final destination, precisely. 
Why is that? Well, the scriptures speak about when the Lord returns, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. It talks about this in Isaiah. It talks about it again in Revelation, that this whole place will be somehow recreated in beauty and all evil will be removed. And this will be the environment, this new heaven and new earth will be the environment in which we are with the Lord forever in our resurrection bodies. So if our final destination in resurrection bodies is the new creation with the Lord, then the life of the saints in heaven right now is a temporary situation. Think about the Apostle Paul. He says, sometimes I don't know whether it's better for me to remain so I can be with you or to die so that I would be with Christ. To live is Christ and to die is gain, he says in Philippians. Or you think about the book of Revelation. We see these pictures of the saints who have died worshiping in heaven presently. Or you think about the book of Hebrews, chapters 11 and 12. It says at the beginning of 12, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses of the people who've lived by faith, let us throw off everything that hinders. Clearly the scripture teaches that when the faithful pass away, their soul, their spirit, somehow goes to be with the Lord in heaven. And it is a blissful, beautiful, amazing experience. And yet, those who have died and are currently in heaven still wait for the return of Jesus, the renewal of the resurrection bodies, and the reunification of all the saints through all of history in the new heaven and the new earth. This is our blessed hope that, yes, a believer goes to heaven when he or she dies, but then they await the day when heaven and earth, the new heaven and the new earth, are reunited in one. There's a new creation and everyone gets new bodies. And Paul says very clearly, actually, that those who have fallen asleep already will receive their bodies first. And those who are alive when the Lord returns, this is what he says in verse 15, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Paul writes about this in more detail, 1 Corinthians 15. You can go over and read that. We don't have time to unpack it all this morning. But the point remains that our hope is that death is not the end. Our hope is not just spiritual, but physical too. Our final destination is to be with the Lord forever in the new creation, which means those who've fallen asleep before the Lord's return, they'll receive their new bodies. Those who remain when the Lord returns will be transformed, Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye. And all of this, all of this comes with this great day of the Lord when God sets things right. And of course, the goal of our hope, if we wanted to summarize what is the object of our hope, what is it that we long for? It's not merely awesome bodies that don't have sore knees or arthritis, or cancer. And it's not merely a new heaven and a new earth where you can look over this created vista and see none of the scars of evil and wickedness marking it. It's, it's not just a new body. It's not just a new creation. The ultimate goal is that we would be with the Lord forever. That God, the ultimate good, who created us from the overflow of his love to be the recipients of his love and to exchange love with him, that we would be with him forever. It's even like not even possible really to imagine what that would be like to be so fully known with God and with one another. I mean, just imagining this, it, it begins to stretch what human language can convey. With that in mind, I do need to say a few things about what is sometimes called in Christian circles the rapture. 
The word rapture is, comes from a Latin word that means caught up or gathered up. It comes from right here, verse 16 and 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds. That idea of being caught up together, that's where the word rapture comes from. Now, there is a much longer debate about how the end times will play out. It involves passages from the book of Daniel, most of the book of Revelation, a number of other scriptures that speak of things like seven years of tribulation, a thousand year reign, sometimes called the millennium, a great battle of Armageddon. Now, again, we don't have time to unpack all of that this morning either. But back to this scene in Thessalonians where everyone is caught up in the air with the Lord. There's been a great deal of debate, especially over the last couple hundred years, about when this happens. Does this happen before the tribulations of God's wrath and judgment occur? Does this happen somewhere in the middle, three and a half years into that tribulation? Is the tribulation seven literal years? Is seven symbolic years? Does this moment occur after the tribulation? I don't know if any of you ever saw that movie, A Thief in the Night. It came out in 1973, and it was actually a horror film. They showed it. I, I remember I was in Christian school, elementary age, and they showed it, and it was terrifying to me. It actually gets its title from a verse very close to the passages we're reading today, right there in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, thief in the night, that the, the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And, you know, the story of this movie begins with this woman named Patty. She wakes up in Des Moines, Iowa, to discover that her husband was gone, along with all these other people. I don't know if you remember, the image for me that sticks in my mind was there was this picture of like a guy mowing the lawn. You guys remember this, if you saw this movie? And then something happened, the rapture, and then he was gone, and then the screen just showed this empty lawnmower, like running, just because that was before they, lawnmowers had the automatic switch off, you know? I think, I think they designed that automatic switch off just in case the rapture happened. We can't have all these lawnmowers in the yards running. But I tell you, that, that mess scared me. And every time my dad would like mow the lawn, I'd be like, oh Lord, <laughs> do not take my father. I trust you, Lord, I really trust you. Take me too. So all this about the rapture, and I mean, it's funny, the movie itself is, is of course, if you watch it now, it's 50 years old, can you believe it? And uh, kind of comes across as a bit tacky. But, but, but all of this is built on the idea of a secret rapture where the Lord gathers up all of the saints from the earth to be with him. And then once that happens, the tribulations and the judgment and the wrath, the millennium, everything else follows. And that idea of how the end times will go became very popular it's actually a relatively new idea in Christian theology. It was basically non-existent until a pastor named John Darby over in the UK uh, put together a number of ideas and began teaching this idea uh, in his settings. He was pretty influential. He came over to the United States in the mid-1800s, met a guy named Schofield. Schofield uh, actually put together one of the first reference Bibles or study Bibles. It also became very popular among lots of American Christians and in the UK. And in the Schofield Bible, the reference notes talks a lot about this idea of the rapture and then the tribulation and then the millennium and so forth. There were a number of very popular preachers through the 1800s and 1900s who also taught this. And so it began to be a pretty prominent concept. And we mentioned a few weeks ago that the late great planet Earth by Hal Lindsey that sold millions of copies, the Left Behind series also are based on this concept of the rapture. And so you find, especially in evangelical circles, a lot of people who have these ideas, this is what the rapture means. Now, I will say, if the Lord wants to bring us all home before things get really bad, I am for it. I heard a guy say one time, he's like, I am totally a pre-tribulation rapture guy, unless the tribulation starts, and then I'm mid-trib. 
And I guess if I'm all the way to the end of the tribulation, then I'm a post-trib rapture guy. Other people have make jokes like, uh, oh, I'm a pan-millennialist. It'll all pan out in the end. Um, these sort of phrases that happen. And, and the truth is that we can put the scriptures together and try to figure it out. But like we mentioned, 1 Thessalonians 5, it's difficult to know. Uh, Paul says in 5.1, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. But let's come back to this concept of a secret rapture that you hear about or see about in a movie like Thief in the Night that draws its inspiration from a passage like this. And there are two things to just look at in this scripture that add commentary to it. First of all, this moment described by Paul does not seem to be in any way secret or hidden. It says, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Now this kind of language of a trumpet call a herald announcing things seems to be very much a public declaration that the time of the Lord's return has come. Now secondly, and this is a very important observation also, when it says, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, when it says to meet the Lord, it's a very technical Greek word that always means to meeting someone on their way and escorting them in. In other words, it is a phrase of hospitality, and it's used several times in the New Testament. It's also used throughout ancient texts in Greek, and if you look up this word again and again and again, it's a phrase of hospitality where a happy person or crowd intercepts the special guest who is en route to make his or her way to you. It would be like seeing a guest coming to your home and you decided to meet them in the driveway and walk them into your home. It's not only a phrase of hospitality, but a phrase conveying an eager and enthusiastic demeanor. It's when you cannot wait to see someone, so when they finally arrive, you delay not a second longer of separation. You go to them and meet them as you walk with them for the rest of the way. Now, this was, of course, the practice in the ancient world. If you ever had a leader or a king or an emperor come to visit your city, you would never sit in your city and simply wait for them to get to your gates and you open up the gates like, glad you're here. No, the entire population of the city would go out on the streets, lining the way to the city and throw a huge parade while the king comes in. And then everyone would come in together. It would be a huge parade. Now... It seems to me that Paul, with the help of the Holy Spirit, is trying to describe what it will be like when Jesus returns. And he uses this phrase, meeting the Lord in the air, as a way of describing that sort of anticipatory, excited welcome of the Lord coming back to the earth. To me, the clearest and best interpretation of this passage is actually not a removal of all the believers, but a welcome to the Lord's arrival. Do I believe in a rapture? Yes, I do, based on this passage. But it's not the kind of rapture you see in the Thief in the Night movie. It's a rapturous moment when the Lord returns to set all things right, renew our bodies, judge and remove all evil, and recreate the whole earth in beauty. Now, is there room for multiple interpretations of the rapture within one church body or within the body of Christ? Absolutely. For a very long time, the church has recognized that we hold our eschatology loosely. And so there are some who say it's going to go like this, this, and this. There are others who say, no, I think it's this, this, and this. Can we all coexist and can we all live with true Christian hope that we share amongst ourselves? Absolutely. Because in all of this, what matters is that we understand the good news of Jesus gives us an object of hope, a vision of the future that is actually almost impossible for us to imagine. Because when all is said and done, and the tribulations and the millennium and everything else is past, and things are the new heaven and the new earth that is promised, it will be in some ways 
like life as it is now, except with every worry, every grief, every wickedness, every injustice, every fear, every anxiety gone forever, healed, banished, and the memory of it will be no more. I mean, just think about the moments of life that are so rich. Maybe you had some this last week and you're just looking at your family, it's beautiful, but then there's always that ominous cloud of going back to work or I'm living with this shame or I should feel happier right now, but I'm not. Or man, some Thanksgivings have been great, but this year it was so lonely. All of that darkness, shadow, despair. When the Lord sets everything right in his return, all of that will be gone and all of the best things in life, everything that you savor righteously now will be so much greater and better because you are with the Lord forever in communion with him. That is our hope, the hope of new bodies and a new creation with the Lord forever. I think about the prayer request that Kristen read at the beginning of the gathering from Gaza and those believers there living in the midst of almost impossible circumstances, their kids suffering, their suffering, people dying all around them. What is their hope? And their hope is this, the restoration that Jesus brings. That's the ultimate hope. Do we pray for and hope for interventions that reduce the suffering now? Absolutely. Do we give and do we sacrifice to see glimpses of the kingdom emerge in the midst of a broken place? A hundred percent, yes. But ultimately, Paul says, I don't want you to be unaware about those who've fallen asleep. I don't want you to be like people who grieve with no hope because underneath all of that, the basis of our hope is the event of Jesus' death and resurrection. The object of our hope is the promise of Jesus' return, new bodies, new creation, forever and ever with the Lord. Last point, how do we hope well? Down in chapter 5, verse 6, it says, So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. The language of armor here is interesting. It means that hoping in a tragic world will be a battle. And what we wear is faith and love as a breastplate. We don't withdraw from the world we don't hunker down in bunkers. We go out into a broken world filled with darkness with faith and love as a breastplate. That means we share faith with people who've lost it. We encourage those who despair. We show acts of love to those who do not have it. Faith and love as a breastplate. And then what's the helmet? Hope of salvation. The way we can go into a world that is tragic and dark. The way we can go into that that battlefield with sobriety was with acts of faith and love flowing from a mind that is full of hope. The hope of salvation is a helmet. And I know this morning we've talked about a lot of things, like probably your mind is full, my mind is extra full. I, I just thought about too many things and couldn't even share them all in the sermon. And yet, if we can fill our minds with the hope of salvation, it is so powerful. Amen. And this is how we hope well. Not merely with human hope, but heavenly hope that we've talked about. What is the basis of your hope? What is your, what do you, what, like, why do you have hope? What is the object of your hope? What are you hoping for? And if you are aligned with scripture on those two issues, then you can walk into the world wearing this hope of salvation as a helmet and it might flow through you into the world in faith and in love.
So Lord, we thank you for this scripture. and I pray that as we have opened our minds to your word, you would work and translate from the mind to the heart, to the spirit and to the soul, and that you would infuse us with true hope. Lord, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you came and born in Bethlehem, experienced what we experienced, suffered more than we suffer, and you are the forerunner. You are the prototype of the new creation. And so, Lord, as we prepare for this Advent, let us, let us prepare well for the celebration of Christmas, but also, Lord, let us wear that helmet of the hope of salvation. Lord, would you put that on our minds? And places, Lord, where we've lost hope, places where we've found despair, places where we're merely hoping in human terms, would you just shine light there, awaken us to the goodness of your promises. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Thanks for watching this Grace Snellville video. We wanna help you get connected to everything happening around the Grace Snellville community. We wanna pray with you and we wanna help equip you to follow Jesus well. Would you just take a moment even now to go to our website at gracesnellville.com. We hope to see you soon.